it's friday so the last katta clutter episode of the week and you know what sort of vicariously i've been attending a macroeconomics class a macroeconomics class and also a class on political economy not directly in the context of india not india's macroeconomy or india's political economy but in general but with reference to pakistan in this case why in reference to pakistan in this case because i been reading up tweet threads being put out by a brilliant pakistani economist atif mia now atif mia is a professor at princeton in 2014 he was listed by the imf to be among the 25 young economists across the world whose thinking will determine economic thinking going ahead and if you go back to that list that includes names like geeta gopinath who's now number 2 at imf after having been chief economist there she is now the deputy managing director there is also esther duflo who went on to win nobel prize there is also thomas piketty and amir sufi amir sufi is originally of pakistani origin but born to pakistani immigrant parents in america now with amir sufi atif mia also wrote a famous book house of debt in that book they argued that the real reason why the great recession or the great meltdown between 2007 and 9 or the global financial crisis at we as we usually call it in india the reason that happened was not because the banks failed the reason it happened was because in the system there was too much debt piled up so these are a bunch of original thinkers now atif mia has been writing a series of threads on pakistan's economic situation right now and therein lie many lessons it also helps us understand what has gone wrong with sri lanka what has not gone wrong in bangladesh while it is tempting to self congratulate but also why to have a more conservative fiscal establishment helps and it has helped india as well not to say that india is booming india's economy if anything over the past 5 6 years has slowed down net net quite substantially but that's another debate the question here is why do economies why do sovereign countries see their economies roll over why do they have meltdown so first of all there is atif mia telling us and it's not just the tweets there are a couple of videos there is an hour long video where he's being questioned by a master student at princeton and he's answering questions a lot of them about what's wrong with pakistan's economy how to fix it there are articles about him and there are other videos and speeches so you read all of them and then you get you understand some basic economics and as i said earlier political economy because behind everything lies politics so here is how he says pakistan's situation looks like now and that is what got me alerted he says first of all that pakistan at this point is out of all all it's completely shut off from all private capital markets why because he says the spread over the dollar in pakistan is now 16% now what is the spread that is the first lesson the spread over foreign currency is the difference between the price at which a dealer sells a currency and buys a currency for example i just google today on buy and sell dollar rates in india so in india buy and sell dollar rates today were dealers were willing to buy the dollar at 78 rupees something but they were selling it at 80 rupees something so you can say the spread over the dollar in india was about 2.5% he says the spread over over the dollar in pakistan is now 16% so pakistani dealers are paying much less to buy dollar then they are charging for selling it that takes pakistan out of the private capital markets it cannot raise any more money from outside that is one second he says if this goes on if this goes on then the doom loop of financial markets will start constricting real economy more and more tightly what that means is that because money is not available in financial markets because your current account deficit is rising because your balance of payments crisis is coming in pakistan's foreign exchange reserves right now 
are just about enough to pay for five weeks imports. That's too little, particularly for a very large country. So unless this bailout from the IMF comes like yesterday, Pakistan is going to be in deep trouble. And default is only one of the troubles, but the fact is these things usually set in motion a chain of events, particularly in an import-dependent society, import-dependent economy. And what are the things that Pakistanis are import-dependent about? It isn't just the fuel. It is today, as Atif Mia also points out, it is today not just the fuel, it's also medicines. A bulk of medicines consumed in Pakistan are imported. And, and in fact, I am reading on Pakistani media that a lot of the medicines have completely gone off the pharmacy shelves. So there is a shortage of medicines. So if, if the country is short of foreign exchange, if the country can't access more foreign exchange, country is shut out of private capital markets, then the country can't raise more money, whether it's on its dollar bonds, or by way of FDI, or by way of FII investment, etc. It only relies on remittances, and that is not good enough. The country may not have enough money to import medicines. And the third thing he says, and that's true, that Pakistan is also today heavily a food importing country, which is a bit of a surprise to me, because for many years uh, we saw, and I used to track this closely when I covered Pakistan, more on a more frequent basis as a reporter that Pakistan's per acre yield, say for wheat, paddy, etc., were much higher than India's. And Pakistan was surplus in both these key commodities as in sugar. But it looks like Pakistan is today short of wheat for sure. Pakistan is desperate for more wheat. Pakistan just has a lot of sugar. But once again, as I hear in another of Atif, Atif Mia's lectures, he says that Pakistani sugar is heavily subsidized because Pakistani sugar also is a political commodity because powerful politicians and elites have captured the sugar industry. They don't pay anything for water. It's very similar in India. You see Western UP, Maharashtra. In Maharashtra, we are growing oodles of sugar, enormous amounts of sugar that nobody needs in the driest parts of Maharashtra. And and we are transferring water from elsewhere in the state. Why? Because power politics in Maharashtra runs around sugar, sugar mills and sugar cooperatives. Sugar cooperatives lead to banking cooperatives, etc., etc., etc. So the same thing exists as a much larger phenomenon in Pakistan. And because this sugar is already heavily subsidized, particularly with free, free water, it's, it's being produced at a price which is not competitive for exports. So Pakistan is producing too little for exports and is dependent on too much, too much imports. Now, are Pakistan's problems today, or say Sri Lanka's problems today, are those only to blame on the rise in oil prices after the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Now that has become like a one-two punch, right? But who delivered the first punch? The first punch was worse than the second punch. The first punch, punch was delivered by the governments in these countries, Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Because in these countries, governments did not up the prices of commodities that were imported to, one, ensure that deficit did not build up, and second, to also calm down consumption as much as they could have. Now, while this crisis was building up, oil prices had been going up anyway. All commodity prices had been going up. But in Pakistan, even more than Rajapaksa in Sri Lanka. In Pakistan, Imran Khan was subsidizing this oil. He was importing oil, all of Pakistan's oil, almost all is imported. He would import it, heavily subsidize it, sell it cheap. And that's when I found there was a lot of, lot of buzz on Indian social media. See, Pakistan selling its petrol and diesel much cheaper than in India. That was an invitation to trouble. And Pakistan got into serious trouble. Sri Lanka did this, but Sri Lanka did much else that was wrong, and we are not going there because we have talked about it. About it, they cut taxes on too many things, particularly indirect taxes, just to please the consumers. And a lot of these were things that Sri Lanka was importing because Sri Lanka also imports a lot of the things of its vital necessity. So in that period, again, Atif Mia points out, Bangladesh was pricing its petroleum products fairly. He doesn't mention India, but we know that India was pricing their petroleum products not only fairly, but very high. Government of India, Modi government was 
adding excise all the time and earning a lot of money on it and thereby, thereby also tamping down the demand a little bit. Why subsidize something that you are importing and whose price is going up? And Sri Lanka was also making similar mistakes. So he says that if oil was the only reason for this crisis, then you would not have a situation where Pakistan would be in such deep crisis. But Bangladesh, which pretty much has the same kind of economic and population base, uh, pretty much broadly, they still had enough money available with them to give a 250 million loan to Sri Lanka to help bail Sri Lanka out in its tough times. Pakistan, on the other hand, is itself going around the world looking for bailouts. In fact, now desperate for its 14 IMF bailout in just about 35 years. So Pakistan is an IMF addict, bailout addict. And once again, once you get addicted to this, this becomes a vicious cycle. So what happens is any government, particularly around time the government is heading for elections or gov government is heading for some kind of a trial of strength, happened with Musharraf also when he, when he was under pressure, the Nawaz Sharif's government did this when it was in their last year or so, that they do a lot of populist things. They throw freebies, they throw subsidies, they don't let the price of commodities for which the country pays a lot for importing, they don't let that price go up and thereby by the time they go because all this does not win them the election. We saw this closer home in India 2014 between 2011, 2012 and 2014 UPA government kept on heavily subsidizing fuel that is petrol, diesel and kerosene and what happened? They got high inflation high deficit, rupee weakened substantially to the dollar. I know that right now everybody's complaining about rupee getting to 80 rupees, but rupee has weakened by about 7, 7.5% in a year, right? That hasn't fallen off a cliff. But in 2012, between March and say July, in just about three months, the rupee had weakened 28%. Right? That was a weakening of the rupee and one of the reasons it happened was again because of this populist economics and general spendthrift behavior by the government of the day. It did not win them elections either. They were reduced to 42 seats. The same thing happened in Pakistan. PML Nawaz lost power. Musharraf left a bankrupt country for PLM Nawaz. PLM Nawaz left a bankrupt country for Imran Khan. So Imran Khan immediately went for an IMF bailout and now he has left a bankrupt country for the new guys. So from where does this problem come? Again, we need to understand the larger principles of economics. And once again, who better to understand from than an economist of the repute of Atif Mia. And before I conclude, I shall tell you something more about him because you might ask me that if he's such a fine economist, so why is Pakistan not using his services? I shall talk about that in conclusion to this episode. Now, he has been warning Pakistan that, look, you are getting into a trap. And the trap is that you try and drive growth by outsourcing your growth. How do you outsource your growth? Either you get a big debt from outside or you get big aid from outside or you outsource the job of building, creating growth in your country or infrastructure in your country to a foreign power, which is what he had warned early on Pakistan was doing with CPEC. Sounds a bit familiar with Sri Lanka, Hambantota, uh, the new Colombo port city, etc., etc., all the money that the Chinese put in. What happens then is when you outsource your infrastructure development and your growth to an outside power, outside power is looking for return on investment. And then what happens is if the Chinese say, come, we will come and build CPEC for you, we'll spend so much money. Right? You have no control, sovereign control over how they are spending that money. So they will come and choose their contractors. That means you, the sovereign country, in this case Pakistan, has no control over whether they get contractors with the best quality, with the best prices or not. So notionally, while the loan may, be, may look like it's only on 2% interest, but if for a job that's worth 80 rupees, you hire a contractor or a builder or a company that charges 100, then 2 rupees there and 20 here and you calculate this becomes like a 27% interest rate. That's how Atif Mia has calculated it. That is 2 plus 20 divided by 80. You can do the math. Now, this is what happens when you tell an outsider, come build my infrastructure. All this area is yours. 
to the west of my country, it's all empty, you build the port, etc., etc. The question is, how, what kind of returns will come on that investment? All your debt has come in dollar, but all your income will come in rupees, in domestic currency. Income will come from transportation, maybe tolls on the, those highways, or maybe truck traffic on those highways. Income will also come by way of salaries to people who work there. That will all be in rupees. So you are earning in rupee, you are having, having to pay back in dollar, and you are creating nothing of such value that you can then export to earn foreign exchange. So that is the trap you get into. So in fact, he says at, that, at one point that with CPEC, the math never added up. Government never did the math. And he says, I know because I asked. So government never did the math. Then he said, look, once this happens, you start losing your credibility with investors and your people. And for any government, say in a country like Pakistan or any weak economy, can be Sri Lanka, uh, external borrowing space is very little because there are only some moments when you can borrow from the rest of the world. Not always. When you're in deep as in Sri Lanka right now, then lenders become very, very cautious. Now, IMF will not give Sri Lanka the money or any bailout unless they are convinced that they have a stable, credible government. IMF, before they give a bailout to Pakistan now, are even looking at Saudi Arabia first because they are looking at Saudi Arabia. If they give the $4 billion that Pakistan is expecting them to give, then IMF will feel more reassured by giving Pakistan more money because they know Pakistan. Pakistanis borrow uh, every few years, three, four years, and again they go wrong. So if Pakistan is an IMF addict, that's the reason I say. Now with this, he says, Atif Mia says, Pakistani politicians have to get, get their act together, which is a uto utopian expectation. And he lays two conditions. One, the politicians should say that we will not play the religion card in our politics. I don't think you can say it anywhere, even in the US right now, particularly in the US right now, you see what's happening with abortion and, and women's rights, etc. But also in Pakistan in particular, because it is an Islamic Republic. And second, he says that you have to do something about elite capture of the economy. Again, again, it's nearly impossible to do in the short run at least, and while Imran Khan has boasted about this, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do this, I'll do that, he's not been able to do anything. In fact, he has got distracted with other issues. Now, while he rules the fact that in Pakistan, there was almost a total ban on any objective assessment of CPEC, that is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, he says, or he introduces us to a term that I had not heard of so far and I know that many of you are economists so you would have known it and maybe I sound naive when I admit that I didn't know it but I'm sure most of us are not economists. That term he uses is Dutch disease. He says Pakistan is not only a Dutch disease but Pakistan is suffering from Dutch disease on steroids. So what is this Dutch disease? Dutch disease is, as I read it, it is something that the Economist magazine coined in 1977. But this is based on something which has happened in Holland or the Netherlands. So anything coming from there is also called Dutch, something that happened there in 1959. In 1959, in the Netherlands or Holland, they discovered the Groningen gas fields, humongous Groningen gas fields. What happened then was that gas field brought so much prosperity and so much economic activity around the gas field that everybody got satisfied, everybody's focus shifted to the gas field and energy and Holland forgot about manufacturing. So while one sector boomed, the other sectors suffered and that had their consequences. That is the Dutch disease. So that imbalance was described as the Dutch disease. So what happens when one sector is growing, the labor shifts there. Uh, then the labor that shifts there gets salaries, makes money. Also people who sell land there make money. All of that is not producing goods that you can export. All of these people have extra money and they buy, they buy goods and services which have to be imported, in which case your trade balance goes for a six. And that is exactly what he had predicted will happen or could happen with CPEC and is happening with CPEC because Pakistan is, has now run up, run up a debt of almost 80, 85 billion dollars against CPEC. There is no way ever 
they are going to be able to pay it just as Sri Lanka realized that there was, there was no way ever they were going to be able to pay the debt on Hambantota port and the Chinese kept it. And why did the Sri Lankans get trapped on it? Because they thought this money was coming for free. For free, the Chinese were coming and building a deep water port. They should have known that they already, already had a pretty good one in Colombo, one in Trincomalee on the other coast. They didn't need one more particularly that close to Colombo. But that port became non-feasible as it always was. Chinese then exercised their rights and took over the port because Chinese were not looking at it purely as an economic investment or return on investment they were looking for was not necessarily financial. For them, it's a big strategic foothold so close to India and in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So that is the Dutch disease. Pakistan has outsourced its infrastructure building and economic growth to the Chinese. One area and one kind of infrastructure is growing that is not producing anything or helping produce anything that Pakistan can export. So Pakistan's current account deficit is getting worse. They are having to import more and more. And because their rupee is weakening heavily, their imports are becoming more expensive. So imported inflation is rising, particularly for a country which is so import dependent. So this becomes a vicious cycle where the country is right now caught. Now we have seen the consequences when Lanka decided to go in that direction. So nobody is wishing such a thing should happen to Pakistan. And in fact, the rest of the world will be very worried. Because a failed state, a state, state with, with a broker economy is a pain for everybody anyway. But a large failed state like Pakistan with nuclear weapons, etc., sitting in such a sensitive geostrategic spot is going to be of great concern to the rest of the world. So chances are in the course of time, IMF, Saudis and the rest will get together and find some solution. But unless, unless the basic politics or the political economy changes, the country will be back before the IMF, maybe in the next three years or so, if not earlier. And you might remind me that I had said in the very beginning that I shall let you know why, why a fine economist like Atif Mia has not been utilized by Pakistan government to help, to help them do better economic planning for Pakistan. The fact is, they tried. Imran Khan, when he came to power, he admitted the economy was in a mess. That was his campaign pitch that PML Nawaz had destroyed the economy. So he set up a committee of economists to advise him, which included Atif Mia. And that led to immediate trouble. Because you know why? In Pakistan's overly religious political environment, overly religious polity, Atif Mia's religious beliefs, he happened to be from the Ahmadiyya community. That became a problem because that is a red flag for the Pakistani conservative Islamists and they said this is unacceptable. So this excessive religiosity in Pakistan's polity deprived Pakistan of one of its finest minds, which is tragic. But you know, when you let religion become so center stage in your lives, then really tragic things happen. Look at Pakistan, for example, not able to fully celebrate the achievements of its topmost, its finest scientists, one of the finest scientists in the world, a Nobel laureate, Dr. Abdul Samad, simply because he was an Ahmadiyya too.